I want to share with you um, one of the very first things that happened on resurrection morning. And you'll find it in John chapter 20 and in verse 11. But Mary, that's Mary Magdalene, was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels or two messengers in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said, because they've taken away my Lord. I, I do not know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. That was the first person to see and connect with the risen Lord Jesus very, very, very early on that first Sunday morning. It had been um, a time of utter anguish for the disciples. They had totally forgotten every word that Jesus ever said, um, even if they understood it at the time. And then a, a terror is a reign of terror because the Romans had arrested Jesus and the way they worked was get the leader of the terrorist gang and then we'll deal with the rest. And so they were waiting to be arrested themselves. And then this morning they come to the tomb, bunch of women, and, and they see the stone has been rolled away. Now that stone um, was on a, a sort of a, a groove and it took 10 men, 10 strong men, to lift that and make it go back down the groove. And here the image is, it's been tossed aside. Um, there's some almighty power picked up the stone and rolled it out of the way. They go in and of course the body of Jesus is not there. Everybody's weeping, everybody's confused. They run back, bring back the guys, Peter and John, and they go in. Mary comes from having gone to them and now she comes um, back again, to, and she's sobbing. This woman is almost hysterical. Um, in some senses, she's out of control. And as she weeps, and the others now are going home confused. Peter doesn't know what he's seen. John has believed, but we don't exactly know what he believed. They're all going until Mary is left alone again at the tomb. And the, the state of mind she's in, have you ever lost something and you go and open the drawer for the 20th time and you know there's nothing there, but you have to go and just check. And she had already been to the empty tomb. She dragged everybody out to see it. But now she goes back and looks again into the empty tomb. This time there are two, and I, I don't like the term angels. We get these ideas of um, come from religious art. Uh, floating creatures, but um, the, these are mighty messengers and, and dressed in white and radiant with light. Uh, and they look at her confused. Um, they say, why are you weeping? Are you a mad woman? That this is the most glorious day in history and you're standing there weeping. You don't get it. And, and she says again, um, they've taken away my Lord. Somebody has been here. They've robbed the tomb. This is a grave robbery. They've taken it. Where, 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 do, where do they put him? And at that time, that, that's the moment, um, she's going to see Jesus. But, but for a minute, look at her there. 
And now I don't want to push this too far. It's very easy to do that. Um, but here is a woman that is devoted to Jesus, but has no comprehension of the resurrection, not even in a matter of hope, let alone reality. And all she can do is, is, is a weeping that is to the point of hysteria. And she, she is in this, this place of absolute devastation, mentally, emotionally. And the fact is, and we've got to follow this through, without the resurrection, that's all you've got. Um, and without the resurrection, then all I can do is glorify the sufferings of Jesus in a way they should never have been glorified. And I make the whole end of my faith, my Christianity ends with Jesus dying on the cross. And that's, that's it. It's over. I've got nothing else to look for. And this woman, um, she, she is in that state. Think, think about this quickly. I don't want to stay there. But outside of the resurrection, if I'm only left with, with the death of Jesus, I am left with guilt, o only not merely guilt of, in my life that hasn't been dealt with, but have you been in those places where the preacher actually accuses you uh, yes. and says, you nailed him to the cross? Well, there's truth to that. There's truth to that. But on the other hand, in the light of resurrection, you don't talk about that. It's a, it's a non, non, um, you, you just, it's, but that, that's all I've got left, you see. It, it is, I am still guilty with my own messed up life. But when I come to the cross, I am told that it was my sin that nailed him there. Doesn't tell me what happened to my sin, or I nailed him there. Um, it can thing, and I'm, I've been in and out of places, and I've heard all of this. I've been confronted with it when um, it, it becomes another um, means of guilt. After all he has done for you, the least you can do. Have you been in that? Um, I've, I've seen that in absolute um, terrible situation where after all he's done for you, the least you can do is give a double offering. Uh, and you know, it, it's, um, and, and we laugh and we should, so we should laugh, it's a circus. But this is where we end up w without the living Jesus. There, there's nothing to this. Christianity is not, in that sense, is not based on the cross. Uh, it is based on the resurrection. Because the only way we can understand the cross is through the resurrection. And, um, and even those who believe in resurrection, um, I, I'm going to get to that in a minute, um, what, what do we do? Where do we go? Um, because resurrection without the Holy Spirit telling us and explaining to us what it means, um, we, we're still in the same boat. There are many that say believe in the resurrection, but they, they have no comprehension of what it meant. Um, you see, once I would believe that the cross achieved an end, and that end was the resurrection, when, when I believe that, that's the end of all my guilt, there's no more shame, I cannot be condemned again, and I can never grovel before God and wail to him about my sin, that's all gone, finished forever. The resurrection ends the cross. It's a whole new world. I view the sufferings of Jesus in an entirely different way. Everything changes, but I say, only the Holy Spirit can do that. And, and I want you to feel what she's going through at this point. And, and I have a right to do that because the Bible spells it out very clearly. Uh, I say this, this woman is in a terrible position. Um, she, she's bending over and all she has to offer, even at the sight of angels. If it, she couldn't care less about angels. Uh, she doesn't even bother to seriously answer them. Um, all she knows that there's been this tragedy uh, 
that's beyond words. And all she can remember is uh, at the tomb and seeing the, the body of Jesus, which is beyond description after what they've done to him. And then she becomes aware there's someone standing behind her. You know that feeling. Um, what I mean is this is not her imagination. This is not the wild craziness of a hysterical woman. She is actually brought to her senses for a moment. Um, the weeping is still going on, but she, her focus is now someone standing behind me. There's a presence there that is strong enough to get through to my head and say he's there. So she turns to see who it is. And it says that even though it was Jesus, she didn't recognize him. Uh, I find that easy to understand on many levels. Uh, the last time she saw Jesus, he, he was, and I use the word very reverently and carefully, he was a bloody, gory mess. You could actually see his bones where they had ripped the flesh away. You could see actually the organs of his body where they'd taken the flesh off with the whips that they gave. Um, add to that a crucifixion. That She was there and she was helping to wrap this body in the grave and, and fill it with the, the spices that they did in those days. There, there's no way that she could think of the person standing behind her as being Jesus. It just didn't click. And, and, and logically, why would she ever think it? Uh, that... Today we speak very swiftly and glibly that Jesus rose from the dead. That was the last thing she ever had on her mind. And to see anybody here through swollen eyes that have been filled with tears throughout the night, um, she could only assume that it's, it's the gardener. Who else would be in this place so early in the morning? But on top of that... Um, Jesus made sure she didn't know who it was. Um, he needs to speak to her. A and so she says, and this tells me the state of her mind. She says, they've taken away. She says to the assumed gardener, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've taken him. Then she said, if you were involved in that, would you tell me where he is so I can go and get his body? Lady, are you crazy? that you are going to go and lift a dead weight corpse and bring it back here. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's in this state, I say again, of hysteria. She's beside herself with grief. And then he said, Mary. That's all. <laughs> but no one on the planet said Mary like he did. No, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice. Now, the word in the Greek there is fascinating. Um, she's standing there in front of the one she assumed was the God, God. And then he says, Mary. Now, in the Greek, it says, or something like this, it says, at once, twisting herself about, spinning and springing to him. I, I've tried to do that. I, I don't know <laughs> how that works, but there was this, this tremendous release of energy, and she leaps forward to him and cries out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for my teacher. He was alive. She felt a real body under his clothes, alive. And in this time-space universe, cast a shadow, gave a presence. He's alive. And a body that has been completely healed of every wound that was placed upon him, except those he chose to keep, which were the nail prints in his hand and the gash in his side. But the others, completely healed. You've got to understand this. Jesus rose out from the dead, not as Lazarus had, not as Jairus' daughter had, all who had a resuscitation. 
That is, they were dead and they were brought back to life, but they would die again. And when they came back from the dead, it, it was a, a wonder, but how could I put it? In, in the life of Jesus, they were getting used to this. But when Jesus rose from the dead, it was something that had never happened before, which we call resurrection, which is death itself had been reversed, which meant the very heart of the cosmos, the very atomic structure of existence had stopped and been reversed. So it's called in the Bible a recreation. It's a new creation. If Jesus hadn't raised immediately, the entire universe would have fallen apart, came to an end. It was resurrection. And in that, he comes to her in a body that could be touched and clung to. I, I'll say it, I'm, I'm pretty certain nobody here believes it, but there's a lot of people right here in Bandera celebrate <laughs> this morning, uh, and they believe that the body of Jesus um, dissolved into gas. Oh, yeah. That, that's Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. And a lot of other people who don't come out quite so bluntly, but that it just was not. It was no longer in the tomb, but it was nowhere else either. It just dissolved. Let, let me insist. We, we believe in the incarnation. The incarnation is a big clumsy word, but, but it, it means that God, God the Son, who is the creator of the human race and all creation, he joined himself. He assumed to himself humanity. That isn't that one isolated person joined to a human body. It means he who made everything now takes it and joins it to him and he becomes a genuine human being. That is, he's never ceased to be God, but he assumes to himself 100% human. That's Jesus, who lives his life here as a 100% human being. But he is God, who has assumed to himself humanity. Now, now think a little bit, what does that mean then? It means that whatever happens to him is happening to all of us. He didn't ask your permission for that, by the way. He's your creator and he's your lover and he stamps his foot and says, I won't let this happen to my beloved person. I'm, I come and I take their history, make their history my history so that my history could be their history. To get that, and so when I meet with Jesus, he, you see, he didn't even have to be here. He's God. He didn't have to save you. Lots of people say he didn't have to save you, and um, and I applaud that. You know, they say you're saved and you're damned, and God's very happy about both of it. Um, that, that's most of America believes that. It's called Calvinism. And um, no, God didn't have to be here. He came by total choice. The choice was, I'm going to take your place and your history is going to be my history. And when it's all done, my history will become your history. That's the gospel in a nutshell. So at the end of his life, which he lived for us on our behalf, he dies, that terrible death. But that's not the end of the incarnation. It isn't that he put on a coat called human, and, and now when they beat him to a pulp, he takes off the coat and said, well, I'm glad that's over. Um, he has taken our history, and he takes this terrible death, which comes to the very beating heart of death itself. He went actually where we don't go. He went right into death. But he didn't take that body in order to die. That's another thing people believe. 
Uh, if you ask, why did Jesus come? People will say to die for our sins. No, he didn't. No, that's only it's, it's a step along the way. He didn't come to do that. He did it, but that wasn't, or put it this way, that is not the terminus. It isn't when the plane lands and says, everybody off, we've arrived. Um, no, uh, this, is, this is along the journey. Um, and so he joins us in everything. He joins us in our broken lives. That's his life. He didn't come here with a halo around his head and walking five feet above everybody else and saying, look what I can do, and you poor suckers can't do it. Um, <laughs> Jesus came exactly where I am. He stood literally in my shoes and he experienced my weakness. He experienced my darkness, my ignorance, my stupid. He experienced it and overcame it on my behalf. And now he enters into my death, my total separation came. And when he rose from the dead, 1 Peter 1 3 says all of us were born again yes. um, I, I know you would say but I was born again you know 10 20 years ago no 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 that's when you woke up to realize you were born again <laughs> that, you, you were born when when he became you and he took you in all our brokenness to death when he rose out of death and was reborn you and I were reborn with him this is the Jesus we're looking at here. Um, but he's not finished yet, you see that. And if, if we finish there, we've missed 90% of the gospel. He didn't, he didn't come just to bring our rotten, broken lives to death and then rebirth us. No, that's part of it, big part. But he said he's come to transform our human existence. Carry new birth to new creation he, he's doing far more than that but if he didn't come in a body if he didn't come so that he's my literal brother if he didn't come so he could literally take the place of everyone and carry that body into death and with that body rise from the dead having conquered our brokenness our sin our darkness and death um if he couldn't do that then we're it was just a meaningless thing, a blip on the radar screen of history. No, he rose in a body. Body. She could feel him. If he didn't, then we don't have a savior. There is no such thing as salvation. So here she is. She's laughing. She's sobbing. She's out of mind for joy. And she held him with a grip of steel. Um... I say that because in the, the Greek says, well, no, the English translation says, don't cling to me, which is good. Um, in your ancient King James Version, for some reason I don't know, they says, don't touch me. Oh, this was not a touch. <laughs> this was, she clings to him. But the actual Greek means to cleave, um, that, and it's an old English word, it's used somewhere to describe when you're so dry in the mouth, your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth. It's called cleave. Uh, she held him. But another meaning of the word is stick to him. Actually, it would be stick as with glue. Uh, so that she held him with a gorilla glue grip. She, it's... And he gently tells her, don't cling to me. Uh, what, what's she doing it for? And Jesus didn't say that to anybody else. Um, so in fact, later on that same day, he's going to tell them to look at his wounds. Uh, so what's she doing? What, what's the matter with this poor lady that she's told, um, don't, don't grip at me like this? Well, how can I put this? They had no idea what resurrection was. Yeah. We hardly know, but they didn't have a clue. In their Jewish theology, they believed that at the end of time, there would be a resurrection. And again, they didn't know what that meant, except that somehow everybody's going to come back to life and 
Well, I don't know. Maybe everybody would come back to life. But still, what, what is it? It was the idea. I, I'm clinging to Jesus because what a relief. He's back. What a relief. And he's back from the dead. Well, either this is the last day of human history or what do we do? He's back. And if he's back, and if he's back from the dead, then he's come back as a better version. The Jesus that went into the tomb was an incredible Jesus. We were with him these last three years. But if he's back from the dead, this is a better version. He's, and he's got more authority. No one's going to mess with him anymore, uh, you see. I can almost hear her train of thought. Everything, everything's going to be all right. Life's going to go back to normal. It's going to be just like it was before in the Galilee when he preached and healed and walked on the water. And, oh, that is all coming back. The crowds, the words that he spoke. Life is going to be wonderful again. The nightmare is over. I gotcha. I gotcha. And you're not going to go anywhere. We're, come on, we're going back to the Galilee. We're, we're going to see this. That is, the resurrection is everybody off the plane, we've arrived. This is it. Jesus said, dear lady, would you get your hands off me? <laughs> this is not it. This is not the terminus. It's a glorious moment in the process, but this isn't it. This isn't the dead end of why I came. Jesus didn't come just so that you and I can be born again. Jesus didn't come to say your sins have forgiven you. That had to be, but it's not the terminus. So, that's upsetting. <laughs> I mean, what is there to preach then? Because I've been in lots of places where everything I hear is what she's doing. Yeah. That's it. Jesus rose from the dead. What does that mean? It means that Jesus, just like in the old days. Well, what's the old days? Well, it means, if I go back to the beginning of the old days, Jesus said, follow me. That's interesting. I mean, if I said to you, follow me, I'm here. You're there, so there's a separation between us, and you are intrigued by me, and I encourage that and say, come and see, follow me. And that turned in a, a little while to disciple, which means those who followed would now try to be like me. They would discipline, disciple, discipline their lives to be like me. Interesting, because if I read much of the American church, they're right there. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Do you remember the, the big movement a few years ago? What would Jesus do? Yeah. That's this. I'm here. He's there. What would Jesus do? Shucks, I've got to keep watching this Jesus who's telling me, follow me, follow me. And, and I've got to figure out. What would Jesus do? I don't know. It's a very upsetting situation. Uh, that's why it died out, because it point comes a point of frustration. You can't handle it anymore. Oh, Jesus said, this isn't the end. This isn't what it's about. We're not going back to Galilee. You'll never, never see that again. That's had its glorious place. But in all of that, we were going somewhere. And when I said, follow me, you followed me all the way to the upper room. When I told you there, I'm going to the Father. I told you there that I would be inside of you and you would be inside of me. This isn't, no, this is a part of it. And you, lady, are living through this history. But when it's all done, you all won't have to live through it. You'll, it'll be there. 
He said, I'm going to the Father. If you've read the New Testament, especially the Gospel of John, that is like a bell that tolls in almost every other chapter that Jesus said, I came from the Father. I'm listening to the Father. I do what the Father tells me. I'm going back to the Father. Or another way he puts it, that going back to the Father, he says, my hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. He says, we're moving there, but that's the hour. That's the going to the Father. And Jesus says, dear lady, get your hands off me. I'm not staying. You can't lock me into this and say it will be like the old days because I'm on my way to ascend to my father. And then he said what he'd never said before, and your father. When I, this time, when I go, you go, because my history is your history, and now yeah. we've got a shared life. Yes. Oh, yeah, that, see, trying to be like Jesus, please, 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 that, that, <laughs> nothing, nothing to do with the gospel. The gospel is this, he's going home to the Father. He came to join the human race. And now he's saying, now human race, you join me and we're going home. <laughs> or you might have heard of it. No one comes to the Father but by me. I came to get you. We're going home. Yes. Of course, again, we'd miss this. I'm not being, well, I guess I am, but <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not being snarky about this. Why is it that the church never talks about this? Why is it they told you if you'd receive Jesus, you'd go to heaven? They didn't say that. Nowhere in the New Testament they say that. It says, Jesus will carry you to the Father. The yes. Father. Yes. It's not a place. It's the most glorious person. The Father who's waiting for his children to come home. And like the one in the prodigal, as soon as he sees you, runs and grabs you and says, you are my son, you're my daughter, you're home. Yes. Yes. What would happen when we go to the Father? Jesus told us in, in that last conversation he had in John 13, 14, 15, 16. He said, when I go to the Father, you are going to receive the Spirit that came upon me, the Holy Spirit came upon me, I'm going to share that with you. And that will be the mark. When the Holy Spirit has come, then you know we're home to the Father. In fact, the Holy Spirit was called the promise of the Father. We're home. We're home. And he said, everything, everything has moved to this. Before there was a creation, when Father, Son, and Spirit decided to create, and what would happen when they create? This was their plan, that you and I would actually be adopted into the family of the Trinity. That was the plan. And when he came, the moment of his birth, and he stepped into the human race, it was, you know, we celebrate the baby, but the baby was, this is the goal. This is why he's here, to go to the Father. That's all the sufferings, that was the death, that's the resurrection. But nothing's finished until he ascends and takes you to the Father. So don't cling to me, don't cling to me, Mary of Magdala. The Christ of memory. <coughs> don't, don't cling. All your memories, put them in a museum. Write them down in the Gospels. They're of vital importance, but we're not going there anymore. Don't set up monuments. Don't, don't build great auditoriums all in the name of... No, no. It's all very wonderful, but I've not yet completed the mission. I've not yet done what I came to do. Only when I've done what I came to do will you have eternal life. See, we've. What is eternal life? Ask anybody. What is eternal life? 
I'm going to live forever when I die. Oh, come on. You were going to live forever anyway. Uh, it's, please, I'm serious. We've got all this religious rubbish that we have been taught and we miss what is staring us in the face. At that conversation, three or four days earlier, Jesus said, and I'm not, I mean, pick out of this, you, you'll hear a lot of what I've just been saying. He's praying, talking to his father. He says, Father, the hour has come. Right? My hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. My hour is not. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. That is on the cross. Let them really see who you are and who I am. He may give eternal life. So he said, Father, the time has come. The hour has come. And you've given it to me to give to these people eternal life. What's eternal life? This is eternal life. That they, you and I, may know you, Father, the only true God, and might know Jesus, whom you have sent. To know. Jesus said, I'm taking you to a relationship with the Father and you will know you're his children. And in knowing him, you will be brought into the family of the Holy Trinity and you will have a life that is beyond human life. Nothing to do with living forever, going to heaven. It's a relationship with the Father. And Jesus said to them, in that conversation, he said, if you'd have understood a word I'm talking about, he says, that I'm going away would not upset you. In fact, you'd have hilarious joy that I'm going to the Father, and when I go to the Father, it's done, it's finished, and you have the Holy Spirit, and you have eternal life. You'd be filled with joy for him and for yourself. Let me give John 14, 28, spoken just a few hours before this happened. He said, if you loved me, you would be rejoicing that I'm going to the Father and the new relationship you have with me. Then John 16, 7 is better for you, supremely better. The word is strong in the Greek language, infinitely better that I go away. Because when I go away to the Father, the Holy Spirit will come and you will go into another realm of living. Or again, he says, Don't, I'm going away, but I will not leave you as orphans. The Holy Spirit will come. He told them. Now it's happened. They, they forgot it. So his departure signaled an infinitely better relationship that was beyond their ability to even imagine it. It's going to be ushered in. Don't cling to me as the Jesus you once knew in the past. Because we're going to a glorious and unimaginable future. So it, the, the past was wonderful. I'm not negating it. But where we're going, where we're going, is where all that was leading. When I go, the Father, I go to the Father, then the Spirit is coming, and he's going to achieve your understanding of this seamless union, inseparable union that I have with you and the two of us have with the Father. So you'll never realize that the gospel ultimately is that you come to know that Jesus through the Holy Spirit is living inside of you and you in him have been taken to the Father and you can look at the Father eyes wide open and say Abba, Daddy, 
Listen, listen. Why don't we preach this? John 17, 21, the same prayer that I just referred to. He's praying again. That they, he's talking about you, and I mean you. He said he prayed for the disciples, and then he prayed for all of us who would believe because of what they said. So that, that's you and I. That they may all be one. Listen. Even as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be in us. That's the gospel. Not go to heaven when you die. It is that you are going to enter into, I call it a seamless, it's an inseparable union. Why? Because he said it's the same as the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. The same as the Holy Trinity, you will now be one with Jesus and so one with the Holy Trinity. That's the gospel. Interesting, I'm not talking about it today, but he goes on to say, when the world sees that, not seeing you go a church member or not you trying to be like, no, 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 no. When the world sees a person that Jesus lives in, and a person who looks at the Father eye to eye and knows you are the beloved, he says, when the world sees that, the world will believe that you sent me. Interesting. With all our plans of evangelism, all the knocking on doors and mugging people at airports, with <laughs> all of that, are you saved? Do you know you're going to hell? Jesus said one thing. Just one thing, when you know who you are, yeah. when you know I live in you and you live in me and we live in the Father, the world will see someone that they'll come to you and say, could you explain how you live the way you live? Think about it. Or again, John 17, same prayer. He says, the glory which you have given to me, I, Jesus, have given to them. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Yes. And what, what is that glory? It is that they, y'all, may be one just as we are one. He repeats it. I in them, you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. This yes. seamless so that the world may know you sent me. Same thing again. I desire, Father, that these be with me where I am. He's with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And he says, we be with him. That they may see my glory which you've given to me. For you loved me, says Jesus, you love me, Father, before the foundation of the world, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. This isn't deeper life. We've only just come out of the tomb. <laughs> this is, he says, don't, don't cling to me, Mary. You, you, how could I tell you what's happening? Where we're going. This is the next on the agenda. Don't cling to me trying to anchor us into the past. What did the past, what's that past that you keep thinking about? Death hadn't been dealt with. Sin hadn't been dealt with. The devil hadn't been dealt with. The law was still crushing you. Religion marched over you. Oh, Mary, that's all been dealt with now. Every bit of it has been dealt with. Now we go on to, this is what we're after. We're after a family where father is the father of the family. I am your brother who shares our life together. And we're one. Come, a new creation is about to be. There's a new covenant waiting to be discovered with wonder. Wonder. 
how can I put this? If you don't get this, it's okay, forget it. But it says in 2 Corinthians 5 that now we know no man after the flesh yeah. and we know not even Jesus after the flesh. Yeah. This is what he's talking about. You, you've known me after the flesh. That is when I was walking among you and, and the flesh was the beginning and end of everything. He says, that's not going to be anymore. And in the past, we defined each other by the flesh. You had to produce a number of good deeds, and then we would say, you're an okay person. We, we judged you after the flesh. He said, you're coming into a world now where it won't be like that because I am going to be inside of you. There'll be no flesh problem. I'll be inside of you, and flesh and spirit will be one. Do you realize how foreign that is to the... Why, we even got a word for it in our vocabulary. It so dominates us. We, could, we, we say, you know, I, I, I'm spiritual. Um, I, I'm, I don't have a secular job. What secular? You know the meaning of secular. It's in the dictionary. It means the place where God isn't. So we have separate, this flesh. This is spirit. So as a good Christian, how do I define myself? I don't do that. I don't do that. I wouldn't go there. I am separated. To what? My ghostly disconnection to everything and everybody because I can't talk to him, I can't talk, I mustn't do that, I can't go there, I, here I am. And I'm left with this almost disembodied life. You can't wear that, you mustn't put that paint on your face. You can't cut your hair, you can't, you can't, you can't. Separate it, separate it, separate it. I'm not a normal human being. I don't know who I am. I'm just this ghostly creature disembodied from the world and Jesus says come with me where your flesh is going to be filled with spirit so spirit isn't over here and flesh is over here it's yes. 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 and now when you look at trees and people you're not going to say I am holier than thou, and I thank you, oh God, I'm not like him. You're going to see. You're going to see. I don't know if you were at our retreat in December, um, but we had a bunch of people there. And we have a, a very dear friend. He's a, a priest in the Anglican Church, but he knows everything we're talking about. And, and he stood there in the foyer of the hotel with all the people milling around. And he was grinning from ear to ear. And he was saying, isn't it wonderful? God loves all these people. And he was just enamored with the fact that all these people in, in the foyer of the Doubletree Hilton, they were all the beloved of God. Do you see what I mean? I, I don't look at them to see if they are them or us. Yeah. They're the beloved. I see spirit and flesh have become united in this one. My life, I don't have a secular job. Now you say, well, he's in full-time ministry. No, you, I, I couldn't have a full It's impossible to have a job where God isn't. Amen. I can't have a secular job, nor can you. I go to work now, and I see everything is alive with the presence of God. I see Jesus in people I never thought I'd ever see him in. And they don't know it yet, of course, but I, I see it. Yes. That's what's happening here, see? That we have entered in Jesus Christ into a dimension that is called in the Holy Spirit before the Father, where we see him now everywhere. It, it, it cuts right into all our fears. 
anxieties. Why, why are we anxious? Because we believe in this case God isn't here yet. If I scream, shout, grovel, howl, he might show up. In fact, that's a good word they use in church these days. God showed up. But, yeah. No, he didn't show up. He's never left you, you see. The futility of life. Get up in the morning to go to work, to earn the bread, to give me the money to pay for further bread, to give me the strength to work. Futile. Unless you see the whole thing is filled with the presence, the glory of God. Facing impossible circumstances. You feel you're being crushed unless you realize that God's in the impossible circumstance as well as is in you. You're, you're in another dimension. So you see, we're not merely saved from sin. We are saved to an unimaginable life of inseparable union with the Holy Trinity through Jesus. So why are you weeping, lady? Yeah. You're standing on the edge of the greatest. Why are you weeping over a dead Jesus? It's, um, well, not only is he not a dead Jesus, he in himself has reversed death. So as Andrew read from that quote from the early, early, early church, that we mock death, and they did. It's the only reason that they could go into the, the arenas and be torn to pieces by animals and be laughing for joy as they did so. It didn't make sense. But, but they were filled with joy because they understood Jesus has completely conquered death. Now they can mock death. I don't have to try and imitate an historical Jesus because the now living, ascended Jesus is living within us. I made a, a point before everybody showed up here this morning. Um, the, the main events in, in the life of Jesus, which all speak into the fullness of this gospel, uh, the, the, for the incarnation, well, the church and the world has totally forgot what that means, but it gets the biggest crowds in, in our ignorance. And, and so with a Santa Claus that they've replaced Jesus with, and, but it, that, that's the big thing. And then we come to Good Friday, and there's a pretty good crowd of religious people that turn out on Good Friday. Um, there's fewer that sh show up on Resurrection Sunday. They don't know what to do. Santa Claus for the Incarnation, rabbits for the Resurrection. Uh, seriously, um, the church only brings in pagan things when they don't know what to do. Uh, and, um, and when it comes to this day, Resurrection Sunday, there's even fewer that, that respond to that. By the time we get, did you even know there was a day on our calendar when Jesus ascended? Did you know that? It's Ascension Day. But the percentage of people who know about that. And then he said, as I ascend and am declared throughout the whole cosmos as Lord and Messiah, the Holy Spirit comes, and that will be it. That's the gospel. And Pentecost, we, we, we don't in any way celebrate Pentecost outside of the church. And so we, we're getting... There's a, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Whatever it is, it's... Um, and applause um, that we, we stop along the way. We cling to Jesus at different points and we miss what it's all about, which is that we are joined 
<laughs> okay. If you're watching, wondering what's going on, there was a racket in the purse here, and it was my phone going off in her. Yeah. So, in Christ, heaven and earth have been reunited. Um, sometimes you hear people praying, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Come on. It happened 2,000 years ago. God himself rent the heavens and came down and joined the human race. We pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's prayed in the light of this. That's not an empty prayer. Heaven can and is now joined to earth. No separation. God is not up. He's not over. I don't have to beg him to come. For I live inside of him and he lives inside of me. We live in this incredible union. The more you talk about it, the more dizzy you become with the mystery of it. But it is the reality. And what is happening out there in this world, where I can look and say, I see the love of God, I see Jesus. Well, what's happening there? The Holy Spirit's business is to throw light on everything that Jesus has done. I can't do that. It doesn't, I, I, there's no word in my whole intellectual, logical language to say it. But the Holy Spirit throws light, opens the eyes of our understanding. And so what it boils down to is, yes, in the middle of a darkened, broken world, and you can put all the subheadings you want under that. The wretchedness, the horror, the misery of this world. That the Bible sums up by calling it lost. Don't know where they're going, don't know who they are. Into our blind ignorance. Where we don't know who he is, we don't know what he's done. We don't know who we really are because of what he's done. But Jesus is there. The Holy Spirit shows light. He hasn't left you. He's there, right in the midst of all the brokenness of this world. And we who proclaim the gospel, that's the only reason I can do it. It'd be the stupidest thing on earth to try and do it without that. If the Holy Spirit isn't telling you what I'm telling you, then I could never convince you. Amen. Holy Spirit is there. Jesus stood right in the middle of our lives and said, I am he that lives. I am life itself. I was dead. That's an amazing. I mean, someone sitting down opposite you just saying, I was dead. Behold, oh, look. I am alive and alive forevermore. And I now have the keys of death and hell. Amen. So if he's got the keys of death, then death isn't what it's cracked up to be. Because when you walk into death, you'll find out Jesus is there. He, he's got the keys. So death then, well, he said on another occasion, whoever believes on me shall never die. Yeah. And people say people are dying all over the place. Are they? Yeah. You die when you walk into the presence of Jesus. Mm. And you see him risen from the dead and ascended. And I thank God for having lived much of my life in more primitive places where hospitals don't fill you full of tubes and hide death from relatives. It happens right there in front of you. And to see people die, they shoot up in bed with eyes alive with light. And yeah. actually I've seen a blue light in their eyes I've never seen on earth. And then 
maybe coming out of a coma, and they do that and they say, do you see him? Yeah. And then they die. Call that death? You were the witnesses as they passed into an invisible world. No, Jesus destroyed death. And he has the keys of hell. And whatever we mean by that, if he's got the keys of hell, he stepped into hell and hell turned into heaven. Because where Jesus is, it's heaven. We, we, do, do you realize the greatness, the finality that split time? So we call this now 2023 A.D. Do you know what A.D. means? Anno Domini, which is the year of our Lord. Because to be politically correct, we now say it's uh, the common era. Yeah. But no, the, it was split in two and got into our history. So throughout the world, it is recognized. 2023, Anno Domini, the year of Jesus Christ. He split it. Life stopped and started. There was the end and then a new creation, a new birth. And it was characterized by, we've been taken home to the Father. You're home. Mary lived all the way through that. She lived through the death. She lived through the resurrection. She lived right through the ascension. And she lived right through the giving of the Spirit. We join her at the giving of the Spirit. We don't have to walk through all the other. But if you don't know all the other, you'll wonder, where on earth are we? And we'll be, be stopping along the way. This, this is it. This is it. We have followed him. And we followed him all the way through death, followed him through resurrection, followed him home. Christ in us. And in my Father's house, there's room for everybody. There's many abiding places. Well, I think I'll leave it at that. And may the Holy Spirit cause our eyes to be opened, not only on Resurrection Sunday, but on Resurrection Life and Ascension, that in other parts is called the Gospel. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Father, for so great a salvation. We thank you. Thank you that we have felt your arms about us as you have carried us to the embrace of the Father. You, Holy Spirit, have witnessed inside of us that we are the children of God. And you've taught us how to say, Father, Daddy, yes. that's who you are. So into your hands we commit ourselves now, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.